Back to Arts and Leisure on the HN Network. I'm joined on the couch now with Sally, an author of the new book, The Life and Times of the Great Danbury State Fair, Jack Stenson. Jack, welcome to the couch. Thank How you. are you doing? Glad to be here. Yeah, now this book has roots that trace back to the 1950s, is that correct? Yeah, or even a, earlier, actually, I should say. Well, the roots trace back to the beginning of the fair, which was yeah. 1869. But the book itself is a bit unusual in that it's uh, written by two authors and not in conjunction with, with each other. It's yeah, usually picked the up case. 60 years later, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, my grandmother, who was uh, Mrs. Leahy, who was the wife of John W. Leahy, that was the last owner of the fair, he cajoled her into writing a book and um, she was qualified. She was an English teacher and had a master's degree from Boston University. And uh, he thought that, you know, if you're that smart, you ought to be able to write a book about the fair. So she did. And she did all the hard work that went into this book, which was digging into the history from 1869. Going through the records and doing yeah. all the research, going through all the records, and, and um, coming up with this nice book. Um, and her book was complete as of 1956. And things being what they are, and Mr. Leahy being busy, uh, they never published it. It got put away. I had heard that they were writing a book, and of course I was 11 or 12 years old at the time. And when they passed away and I cleaned out the attic of their house, lo and behold, I find this There's manuscript. There's the manuscript, yeah. Right. So I read it and I was impressed. It's, uh, it's very well written, it's humorous, it's full of personal asides. Uh, if you knew either of the Leahy's, you could actually hear their voice uh, in, in the, uh, you know, the writing of it, uh, which I enjoyed. And I thought, you know, this really deserves to be published, especially after all the work she put into it. Um, this was 1983. I was busy. I was raising my family. I was running our fuel business and had half a dozen other things going on. So I'm on. back in the drawer. Back in the drawer. A <laughs> uh, couple of years ago, my 70th birthday came along and I got thinking about it and I said, you know, Jack, if you're going to do this, you'd better sit down and do it because time marches on. And, and so I did. And what I did was I updated the book. There were almost 30 years of more history mm -hmm. of the fair to tell. So I updated the book from uh, 1956, including a lot of my own experiences, um, to the end of the fair. And, and that's part two of the book. Part two of the right. book, exactly. And what was not included in Mrs. Leahy's book were the photographs. Uh, what we have remaining from the fair are hundreds and hundreds of photographs starting around World War I. So my big job was to select some photographs to illustrate the book uh, from a century of photographs. And uh, that was mind-boggling. That was harder than writing the book. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say narrowing down. Yeah, you could almost do a, a photo album just of, of the fair with, with no text. We have on the screen right now a picture from probably the 20s. And the, I, I contributed this one just for the show today because my grandfather's in it. He's the guy with the bow tie standing <laughs> in the center. Um, the Danbury Fair started as, a, as an agricultural fair back it, in the mid-19th century. Uh, that's right. Actually, it's, it uh, grew out of a horse race track. Uh, there had been a practice trotting track on the grounds over there. It was probably one of the only flat areas yeah. in all of Danbury. And um, horse racing like it is now was, was a, a playtime for the rich and mm -hmm. wealthy. And several of the wealthy Danbury industrialists, hatters, bankers, and whatnot owned trotting horses. They had a lot of competition going on between them. But the circuit, the rec recognized sanctioned circuit, um, didn't come to Danbury because there was no real good racetrack. So they decided to get together and build one, and they did on those premises. Uh, within a couple of months, the town fathers thought, gee, why don't we get together with these guys? And of course, they knew everybody, mm -hmm. and put an annual fall fair together. So they struck up an agreement, um, borrowed a tent from P.T. Barnum, and ran the Who first, from far, first right. fair in, in um, um, September of 1869. It was successful. Um, they made a profit. They plowed the money back into it, as they did for many, many years. And it became a, a nationally known event. Uh, they were very successful at what they did, and, and uh, it worked out very well for them. 
And this was still mostly agricultural displays and, and um, livestock. And did they have all the midway and entertainment that? They had the midway and the entertainment, uh, but it was primary, primarily agricultural. Um, the biggest participants in the Danbury Fair were not so much from Danbury, but from all the surrounding towns where all the farms were. Mm -hmm. And it was typical, I know the Hurlbut family from Roxbury uh, used to march their cattle all the way from Roxbury <laughs> through the city of Danbury out to the Danbury Fairgrounds in order to exhibit them. Yeah. And of course there was a lot of competition between the breeders, uh, whether it be uh, horses or cattle or dogs or poultry. Uh, even hay, they had hay competitions to see who could grow the rest, of the best hay. And of course, it was the uh, harvest season, um, the agricultural summer was over, and everybody got together and it was a, a great big social gathering as well. Uh, so they had uh, all these meets and um, got together every year traditionally to say hello to each other because they worked hard all summer and have a good time. And of course, uh, the entertainment grew out of that. The carnivals and the midways and the grandstand shows and, and all that uh, came along at the same time. When did John Leahy get involved? Well, John was running a fuel oil and propane business in a machine shop. And he was always interested in entertainment, but he was very busy with his business. Um, the fair was shut down for World War II because of rationing and the fact that two million, two and a half million men were overseas fighting the wars. Uh, one day a woman comes in that was his customer and she owed him a little bill and she said, Mr. Leahy, I'd like to help settle this bill with a share of Danbury Fair stock that I own. Would, would that be acceptable? And he thought about it for a little while and he said, absolutely. So he traded the balance of the bill for the share of Danbury Fair stock and took it home that night to Mrs. Leahy, my grandmother, and he said, I acquired a share of Danbury Fair stock today. And Mrs. Leahy was a very frugal, uh, practical, conservative person. And she what are you spending money on that for? <laughs> exactly. And, and she said to him, why, why, whatever are you going to do with that? And he said, well, I really don't know. But the next morning, he hightailed it down to the corner of White Street and Main Street, where the uh, offices of the Danbury Fair were. And he went upstairs and um, saw Morty Rundle, who was the president. And he sat down with him and he said, I've got a share of Danbury Fair stock, you know. And they talked over whether he paid enough or too much for it. And Morty told him, you know, the fair is in pretty rough straits uh, these years. We haven't had anything going on. Uh, we've got mortgages because we had a big fire before the war and we borrowed a lot of money. Uh, we've got maintenance and taxes and insurance. And this war is dragging on forever and I'm not sure it's ever going to reopen. And uh, Mr. Leahy said, well, maybe I'd like to buy more shares of stock. <laughs> and, uh, Sounds like a crazy person. <laughs> exactly. Well, Mr. Rundle had no offspring that was interested in the fair, and sure. he was getting into his 80s. So he thought, gee, here's somebody that's interested in plowing his own money and time and enthusiasm into this. So little by little, he sold him his stock, and John went around the countryside and found all these single shares of stock that a lot of people owned and bought him up and started to put his money into improving the fair and rebuilding the buildings, paving the walkways, adding little green benches for people to sit on. And in 1946, as soon as the armistice was signed uh, and the rationing was lifted, he started his first fair. And that was the beginning of another whole generation of the Danbury Fair. Now, oh. did he call it the Great Danbury State Fair? Was that his? Uh, yeah, I, it had been known as the Great Danbury Fair it already, had. and he, he was an entrepreneur, and when he saw an opportunity, he took advantage of it. And he got thinking, you know, most states have a state fair. Connecticut does not, and uh, never did, and didn't seem interested in getting into that. So why don't I just call it the state fair? It was the largest fair in the state. And so he did. It was deserving of the title. Exactly. That's what he thought. Yeah. And there was a little grumbling about it among here and there. Why is it the state fair? It's not official and whatnot. But he paid no attention to that. Nobody stopped him. And that was the uh, name of it forever after. <laughs> and he, I, I remember, I used to go to this when I was a kid. And, sure. And um, he collected uh, all kinds of interesting things for the fair from World's Fairs and... Um, 
he had uh, Jumbo the elephant. I don't know where that came from, but he, there were so many weird displays in that in that fairgrounds that children still remember. I think um, from going, even if they were. Uh, my sons are in their early 40s now, and they remember going as kids. And, sure. And it was one only one a of few the times. things that John recognized was that in um, the Danbury area, agriculture was beginning to die out, and we were becoming more urbanized. And uh, we need to put together some entertainment for people who don't know a chicken from a goat. And uh, so he started to buy these uh, figurines and statues and started to build some larger-than-life statues. Paul Bunyan was one, right? Exactly. He had Farmer John and Uncle Sam and Paul Bunyan and, and uh, a large Indian, a big waitress. Uh, he actually did an entire uh, eight-horse Clydesdale hitch representing the Budweiser hitch uh, because they came every other year with their hitch. And he ended up with hundreds of these figurines uh, he collected old wagons, he collected old tools. Uh, the place was a museum all by itself, even yeah. without the carnival there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it became uh, really the most unique fair in the United States because nobody else did anything like that. And it drew all kinds of celebrities. So you have a picture in your book of Elizabeth Taylor and Mike Todd there. Right. Uh, of course, we had all the governors. Uh, Governor's Day was Wednesday of Fair Week every mm -hmm. year. So whether they were Republican or Democrat, they were all welcome. <laughs> and uh, they brought all their politicians with them. And, and rode in a parade through the fairgrounds. Exactly, yeah. rode in the parade and uh, all made their little non-political speeches. Uh -huh. And along with them uh, became a, a, a lot of other different movie stars and, and whatnot. Uh, I met Bobby Riggs over there one time and um, uh, a, a number of other, Elizabeth Taylor and Mike Todd came. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor's birthday was coming up, and somehow they knew about the Danbury Fair, and Mike Todd was going to have a birthday party for her in Madison Square Garden, of all places. And he wanted to have a big parade and do a lot of fantastic things, and he'd heard about the Danbury Fair. So he came up to talk to Mr. Leahy about hiring some of these things and putting on a big parade in Madison Square Garden for Elizabeth Taylor's birthday. Wow. And they did. And I happened to be there. I was probably 13, 14 years old, so I got to meet the both of them. Pretty exciting. Yeah, I was going to say, exciting. it must be pretty cool yeah. for a teenager. Yes, it sure was. And Marian Anderson, who, who lived in Danbury, sang at the fair? Uh, yeah, uh, she did sing at the fair. I don't know exactly when that was, but mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Leahy ran a set of operettas uh, during the summer in, in the um, early 50s, mm -hmm. and she was a part of that. And uh, so that was kind of awe-inspiring as well. Yeah. yeah. That voice People that want to read more about the uh, fair, there's going to be a book signing, and you're going to be talking this Saturday, correct? Right. In um, Danbury at the Museum and our, Historical our, our Society. Our book has, has uh, just come out. This is kind of a, a mock-up. The hardcovers are in transit, hopefully, at this point. And we're having a, uh, a book signing at the Danbury Museum and Historical Society, 43 Main Street in Danbury. 4 p.m., uh, don't be late. That's right. <laughs> So it's going to be this Saturday, October 1st, and start at 4 o'clock. Okay. And you're That's going to talk a little. We're going to talk a little, and okay. we're hoping to see everybody there. And Good. is there two, two different times, 4 and 5.30? Uh, depending on how many people show up. Okay. I think you should <laughs> bring a big crowd. Right. Oh, I think you will. Topic, oh, I think you yeah. will. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jack, for coming on the couch and talking about the book. Thank you. Enjoyed being here.